Launch off sequence has started. Crew one for all. Hi, Jessica. I'm Jessica Fox. I am a film sector specialist for Expo North Digital. I'm Ed Hoffman. I'm a longtime friend of Jessica's. We uh, we started working together. It feels like yesterday, but we worked together starting at NASA around the theme, uh, which we're exploring today, of stories. We also bonded over film. But every once in a while, I wonder, man, maybe I should have gone into movies. I love the fact that they're really an inspiration. They're a fuel for our own personal launches uh, of wherever we're going. I think that movies uh, are the art form of uh, our century. Our ancestors would go in and they would look at artwork or they would read books and things and, and that's what they would get. But movies over the last hundred years as we come together you know, as people in terms of dreams, possibilities, understanding things, we get emotional uh, around uh, these things called movies. That's the affinity of everything I think that that brings together the, four, the Fourth Wall podcast. Expo North's funding it. It's an incredible program where we're <laughs> sending people to the moon. It's a very comfortable shuttle that they've sent us. We want to thank Expo North for their generosity. Enough room for three movies and a snack. No, that makes sense because spe- weight is a major enemy of launches. They're, they limit things. So they limit entertainment. And most practically, uh, three DVDs would fit kind of the weight uh, that we we have available. Plus, the DVDs have special features. You need films, you need stories, you need something that connects you with Mother Earth. So with this godlike power, who have we chosen to put on the moon? The great Larry Prusak. To me, you want to start with a place that's going to have a philosophy of people, of the ability to learn, adapt, and appreciation of, of the importance of knowledge. How do you identify it? How do you find it? And how do you help it... Uh, you know, uh, disseminate and spread. And who better than the man who's been doing this throughout his life, uh, Larry Prusak. He did that at IBM, at Ernst & Young, with McKinsey at NASA, large part of the work we did together at Babson at Columbia. This is the this is the experts expert around knowledge and learning, and certainly one of the people who would be perfect for being our uh, executive director for Moon Knowledge and how we survive and and flourish. Plus, he's a kid from Brooklyn, so he can never have enough Brooklyn in in the uh, in the spacecraft, as they say. Hey, Larry. Hi, Ed. This is such a joy. (laughs) How would you describe what you do? Just another schmuck from Brooklyn. (laughs) Ed would probably say the same thing. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I did realize I am in a Brooklyn sandwich here. Am I uh, the only Boston Red Sox fan? No, no, I'm a Boston Red Sox fan. I Are like you? The, yeah, yeah. Well, I've lived here f- more than half my life now. Larry, I know why we're sending you to the moon. If the moon is going to become a stage for future missions, to have a center of knowledge there. Otherwise, what are we taking with us other than ex- extra fuel? So actually to establish a center for knowledge on the moon so that we have something to export and bring with us and keep us sane on our, our missions, I think is not such a bad thing. One of the questions, Larry, you always asked in the classes or in, when you're working with groups is, if we valued knowledge as much as we value money, what would society look like? And so going to the moon would give us the chance to find that out. And now we're about to send you to the moon. And I don't know if it's a very smart mission, but you pick some pretty phenomenal movies. And I was just curious if we could dive into your first. Shackleton because he was in an incredible, incredibly unpleasant <laughs> environment. Do you feel fear when you embark on an adventure such as this? Yes, Your Majesty. What's going on? The ice is shifting. It's got a grip on us. Shall I give the order to abandon? If we don't have news very soon, it means that they're in trouble, doesn't it? I'm afraid it does. I mean, his ship was caught in the ice. They had no food. They just had dogs and sleds. The weather was what you'd imagine in the South Pole to be. And uh, if I was on the moon, I suppose it'd be a very inspirational thing to see what he did, how he managed to get all his, him and all his men out of there and safely back to England. And some from, from Scotland, actually, in Ireland. It's a wonderful film to teach you. It's easier to show a movie, to demonstrate wisdom, practical wisdom, than to just say the words. 
I mean, the words work, but, you know, they're translated and things like that. But a film really shows that much more effectively. Is there a particular moment that stands out for you in that film? There's two of them. One is he always ate last. They had very little food. They had to eat the dogs, they had to say. They had to find seals. He would eat last. And if there was very little food left, he'd eat it. There was a point in the movie where um, someone lost their fur, you know, their fur-lined coat, the coats they were wearing, and he gave his coat up. He, he was a very, very selfless man to keep his team together. If a leader is selfless, you know, they put themselves behind the actual people doing things. The Greeks, the classical Greeks, they had seven different words for knowledge and wisdom. And one of them was a word called phronesis, which is practical wisdom. The knowledge you use in your day-to-day -day life, not aesthetic wisdom, not spiritual wisdom, not mathematical wisdom, but the wisdom you use in everyday life. That movie really demonstrates that. You know, Shackleton mentioned in the film what a burden it is to know that people are relying on you. He seemed very conscious of that fact. He, he determined to get them all back alive, and they knew it, and it inspired the men. They knew that he was just living to get them back alive, so they put up with all remarkably difficult conditions of living. He had uh, failed previously, right, at attempts, if I remember the movie, and I remember at one scene, yes, someone, uh, you know, an upper crust person was saying, well, you know, you talk about this new adventure, but you failed before. And uh, he says, he said something along the lines, I don't worry about this notion of failure. He says, this is something we're contributing to. And if we fail again to go to the North Pole, I remember him saying, there are other people like, you know, Captain Scott or Asmundson or others who are doing this, and maybe they'll get there. And I thought that's such a beautiful um, message, I think, that's in common of explorers and people who learn and people who take risks. You yourself don't have to have the ultimate success. If you're really into it for the larger purpose, then you get a joy out of contributing to other success. There isn't a jealousy of I got to get there first because then it, then you fall, then it doesn't happen. And that totally rechanges the notion of failure. Uh, in a place like NASA, failures in a project are, can, are often a good thing because, okay, that doesn't work, what will work? That that line you always uh, you said that always stuck with me from the very first time I heard you speak, Larry, you said, knowledge is profoundly social. I actually was a little skeptical about, I thought maybe they romance, so to say, the story. So I went to the library. There were other people on that journey who wrote their memoirs of it. And the library had some of those books. And it turned out that's pretty pretty true to life, the uh, movie. It was really uh, it was really like that. So you said there were two moments that stood out to you. Do you remember what the set, besides eating the eating last, what was the second one? He put down that mutiny in a very clever way. There was a somewhat of a mutiny among the men, which is understandable. He said, look, I'm the leader. I'm going to get you back alive. If you don't want me to do this, you can leave now. You can try to do it on your own. And he did it in a very intelligent and wise way, rather than shoot the guys, which he could have done, or abandon them. But he didn't. He talked them into staying with him. He said, I'm going to do this. You have to trust me to do it. And the majority did. And even at the end, the most cynical, the carpenter, he joined in. He built a ship that went to the other island that allowed them to find refuge and get get home safely. So it was a remarkable thing. Again, a lot of people I've met in the military and all just would have shot them. He was just a born leader. I, he born or he learned it, but he was really he really was a wonderful a wonderful example of leadership. One of the things in that that example again it 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 speaks to there's an overriding importance of of the people and what you're trying to do. We know that there's a lot of people maybe that'd be called uh, narcissistic or arrogant who they lock into a mission and then it's their mission. And they're going to stay with the ship until it goes under the ice. And again, I remember him in, in the movie basically saying, the mission isn't the ship. The ship is what we're trying to do. And part of it is that we get back safely. You're not into your own narrative to the point where you don't care about or see anything else. And so he's constantly adjusting. He's constantly adapting. And he has this sense, uh, which I always wonder for, where do you get that kind of a larger calling? Is it to the people? Is it to his wife back home? Is it to uh, other principles and ethics he has? But he continuously in that movie, he, he makes decisions that are harder decisions. But I think that people looking at it basically say, okay, 
this isn't somebody who's doing it for himself. This is someone who's doing it for others. And it's, it's, you can't go through that without feeling inspired and just feeling good in terms of what's happening. There's a goodness and a warmth to ethics and concern for other people that really shines through in that movie. On that point, as a leader, how important is it that you make your team aware of what the true mission is? If I had to pick the leading uh, attribute of a leader would be to tell a story about the mission. This is why we're doing this. This is what we're going to get from it. This is what the world will get from it. We're really bereft of great leaders in the world today. There's very few of them around, it seems to me. But when they emerge, it's really important to tell a narrative. Why are we doing this? Why are we waking up in the morning? Why are we working very hard? A couple of times I've consulted with pharmaceutical firms. One time I was at Bristol Myers Squibb and Lance Armstrong spoke before me because he had cancer and Bristol Myers produced a drug which saved his life. And he was talking to the oncology researchers. There must have been three or 400 of them. And he thanked them. He said, you saved my life. You had this mission to solve this particular brand of cancer and you saved my life. He was tearing up. The audience was tearing up. I was tearing up. It was the most moving thing. These people had a mission in life to solve this type of cancer. They did it. And here's a well-known man thanking them in public. Those days, it was before we had phones. You could you could take, make a copy of it because I I definitely showed that to students when we're talking about missions and the role of narrative in bolstering the mission. Now that you have Shackleton with you, with all that wonderful wisdom and knowledge of leadership, what's your second choice? I would pick Invictus, the movie about Nelson Mandela. Today marks the beginning of a new era in South Africa, as President Mandela takes office in Pretoria, facing issues that range from economic stagnation and unemployment to rising crime, while at the same time balancing black aspirations with white fears. Brenda and I went to South Africa the first time before um, he became powerful, before he was running the country. And although it's a beautiful country, we love seeing the th- animals and the thing. it was miserable. You could tell it, sense it in the air. This is a place that's ready to explode. And then we went back. We got invited to teach at Stellenbosch University there. And Mandela had been there, did done his work, and had passed on. What a difference. I mean, he, he did a great thing talk about leadership. They could have been an incredibly bloody civil war in that country, but it didn't happen. In terms of practical wisdom, he'd be my first choice. Uh, He was a remarkably wise man who could have played to the mob. He could have done all sorts of things and no one would have condemned him for it. I mean, frankly, a lot of people would have said, good. He he prevented a civil war, a really bloody outcome, which very few people have done. Even Gandhi and Nehru couldn't do it. I mean, it was a tremendous amount of people died when India broke off from England. But he did it. I, I can't think of too many other people who, who did that. Lincoln couldn't do it. And the movie just picks one little thing about the uh, football team. In many ways, you picked another captain, right? Uh, Shackleton was a captain of his ship. Mandela was really a captain of his people's souls. But he shows the power of an ethical you know, leader, maybe a servant leader at the utmost, who um, who believes in the power of forgiveness. Nowadays, a popular notion is to, to reframe a situation. You can't always look backwards. You can't do a tit for tat. You can't do this happened because of so. If you want to get to the next generation, if you want to get to the moon, if you will, you have to be able to go past things that have gotten in your way, barriers, problems. And that act of forgiveness, which is, I think, throughout the movie, becomes, again, kind of a fuel for the fact we can go to a better place. And so many leaders, so many politicians, unfortunately, they do just the opposite. Uh, They don't lead with forgiveness. They lead with, uh, let's create an anger and division. And that's where I'll get my source of power from. So I think it's a fascinating movie when we watch that, of, of, of that currency for leadership, forgiveness, and the ability to Get away from fear. Fear is often used by autocratic leaders to, you got to do this or awful things are going to happen. And Mandela uh, didn't do that. And the Springboks didn't end up doing They used it 
around the notion of uh, it's not about fear. It's about forgiveness and doing something that matters to us now. As a wonderful vehicle to understand, you do have to capture the imagination of a country if you want them to dream better. This film focuses on Matt Damon's character and the World Cup. Pressure on him to not do that, you know, not play with the Springboks uh, was so strong. You almost feel the tension when you're watching the film of what is he going to do? Well, I knew in advance what he was going to do, obviously, but it was very well made, the tension he must have felt. How easy it would have been to say the hell with them. You people are racist. We're going to have an all-black team, things like that. And most people would have done that. I think most, quote, leaders, unquote, would have done that. I think they need like 50 Mandelas in the world today. The whole Israeli situation, I could just think of someone like that could have maybe made great progress with the Palestinians and the Israelis. In in the United States, surely we need people like that. We don't have any. He was the descendant of a chief, of chieftains. And although I'm not so much a great believer in inherited characteristics, but clearly it's no, he was a tall, good-looking man. I mean, those things do matter. I, it sounds odd to say it, but they do. And he had sort of chieftain on the prison island. He led the prisoners he he made them read. He had a he had a volume of Shakespeare, which is in his cell. They show it, and he'd have them read Shakespeare. He'd have them read the Bible, the parts that they thought were re- relevant. He was just that way, and they all looked up to him. Larry, in your own career, has there been times where you walked into an organization, maybe not as a much of a powder keg as South Africa had been, but have you ever been in a situation in which you thought actually the room is completely divided, and I have to channel some um, Mandela wisdom here. That happens all the time, Jessica, if you're a consultant, sure. Especially talking about knowledge, which still is not acknowledged as being critical for an organization's success. Like, oh, no, we have to invest more in technology. No, no one, the management will never buy this. What are you talking about? The first couple of years when I was doing this sort of work, People sort of get angry at me. Say, "What are you wasting our time talking about knowledge?" I think. There was a bumper sticker I used to see in Lexington: <laughs> "If you don't like knowledge, try ignorance." And I began to tell people that. I said, "Well, you could always be ignorant. See how far that gets you." Both of you are interested in knowledge. Both of you are interested in movies, and you're both from Brooklyn. How much of Brooklyn set you on your journey? Brooklyn was astoundingly multi-ethnic. There were. Every type of person you could imagine lived there. It was three million people there when we were growing up. Once I got old enough to take the subways or go around by myself, I thought it was fascinating that in the same city, the same borough of a city, you could see such remarkably diverse cultures. Then I began to think about how much knowledge is determined by the culture you grow up with. You know, when I went to college, I had an Italian girlfriend and, you know, she, she she was smart, but she had a very different way of looking at things than I did, and not better or worse, just different. And then we, I had some Irish friends who also were very, very different culture, you know, very... So it was fascinating. Uh, the other thing, and Ed, Ed would agree with this totally, is you had to be a good storyteller to survive, unless you were really strong and a good fighter. For our British audience, what does that mean? Well, I'll give you an example. I'll give you one example. Ed could give you some himself. <laughs> there were a lot of tough people. I mean, it, you know, they were just tough kids. And I was once walking with a friend of mine. There was a movie that opened up called The Bridge on the River Kwai. And we heard about this and we were dying to see it. We were 12 or 13 years old, 14, whatever. And we were dying. So we saved up enough money, a dollar, to go see the movie. And the movie, to get to the movie house without taking the train because he wanted to save our money to buy popcorn. We walked through a tough neighborhood. There were neighbors that were just were tough. And of course, as we're walking, we got accosted by a bunch of kids who said, we want your money. And I said, well, I said, let me tell you, my father is the chief of police in the 74th precinct here. Now, it happened to be I knew this guy's name for some reason. I said, my father is the chief of police. He's Lieutenant Garrity. I said, you can bother me, but I will guarantee your parents will be arrested for doing this and you'll get the, you'll be walloped, believe me. And I said it convincingly and we kept our money and saw the movie and could buy popcorn. Normal story for Brooklyn. Yeah. To survive, I would say you had to have one of three things. You either had to be really tough, strong, you had to be really fast, 
or you had to be a good storyteller. That's why I had Nye are still here. I wasn't fast and I wasn't strong. It was a very verbal place. I, I guess there's no other way to put it. I'd go to, there was sort of a cafeteria near where I lived and friends and I, and I would sometimes go there for a cup of coffee. And the old men, they'd tell us stories about the mob, the mafia, uh, criminals they knew, uh, things like that. And we were entranced by these. So who knows if they were true or not, but we were entranced by the stories. And you didn't know exactly which one was being used to get to something in a certain way or which one was true or anything like that. I remember asking a girl out in junior high school, and it was the best turndown I ever had. She says, oh, I'd like to go out with you, and I will. But uh, I have two brothers who really don't want me to be dating someone so it's possible that, that they would beat you up. Are you okay with that? And I said, absolutely not. I'm not okay. And I've never, you know, I didn't know, you know, if that was a true story, it could have been or, you know, but uh, every day was a story like that. It was, uh, you know, uh, in all different ways. This Italian girlfriend I had, uh, the first time we went out on a date, she uh, said I was going to take her to a home. She lived in Gravesend, the neighborhood in Brooklyn. I think it's actually named after a place in England, actually. And she said, why don't you drop me off in the corner? Don't don't take me to the door. I said, yeah, you know, why, why? And she said, if some of the fellas here see you with me, it wouldn't be good for you. Yeah. <laughs> It's good preparation for any organization. I used to say if I could survive Brooklyn, I can survive now any place else because really it's organizations that they'll do things in nicer ways, but they're very clear on who belongs where and the, the nature of who's part of this team and who's part of that team and how do you do things. And they better not see me talking to you because, you, you know, what's, yeah, it's very, it was good preparation. Yeah, everything I needed to do, I learned from growing up in Brooklyn. The launch is going to happen soon. If it's not in Brooklyn, what is the next film? Well, I picked the Steven Spielberg's movie about Lincoln. I can't accomplish a goddamn thing of any human meaning or worth until we cure ourselves of slavery and end this pestilential war. And whether any of you or anyone else knows it, I know I need this. This amendment is that cure. We are stepped out upon the world stage now. Now! With the fate of human dignity in our hands. Aristotle wrote about the qualities of practical wisdom. And one of them was epistemic humility. Having humility, I don't know everything. I'm open to learning new things. So here's Lincoln listening to people who were his rivals, who were political rivals and all. He listened to them and he put them together. Uh, having epistemic humility, listening to other points of view, really made Lincoln the leader he was. I mean, I think he was also had great qualities of a leader, but you know, he was made fun of. People made you know. A lot of people didn't like him. He was odd looking, tall, and you know, they called him instead of Abe, they called him Ape. But the, having that epistemic humility, he listened to people, he read everything, he talked to people. He was just a genuinely good man and a wise man. I think he's, we haven't had many presidents in the United States who were wise, but he was certainly at the top of the list, the very top of the list, I would say. We don't get to spend that much time with Lincoln in books or pictures. So it, it was quite amazing to see him in 360 degrees. I heard Doris Goodwin talk about that. Someone said, how accurate do you think that movie was? She said it was wonderfully done. Spielberg had a lot of consultants who really knew what they were talking about. You, know, you should show a movie like that when you're teaching American history. It'd be a great thing to do. They just don't do things like that. So what Ed's saying, you know, it's a just as good a way of learning as reading a book about it. I knew he took like over 10 years to get that movie ready. They focused really, I think, on the premise of what are the trade-offs? What are the decisions? How do you go about getting that, uh, you know, the, the the slavery issue taken care of? And some people, I think, even criticized, well, it, it just focused on them. But I think that was the power of uh, that for leadership. For anything you do, how do you prioritize? How do you focus in on what is most important? How do you give things up that you would like to hold on to but because it's so important, this will get you the, the thing that you value most. And I think that to me is, is one of the things about the Lincoln movie that I think is so uh, memorable is that the fact that they were able to prioritize 
it's a, there's an oldness to watching the movie. So you feel like you're in the period. I don't know how they did that, but the shots and the colors are done in a certain way. So you feel that you're you're really in the room. As I said, he really demonstrated, a little like Mandela, practical wisdom. He couldn't prevent the Civil War. It was just not preventable. But it's a wonderful it's a wonderful portrayal of practical wisdom in action. Again, if they made a movie about Franklin Roosevelt, a good movie, I mean they made a few, but they, they weren't that good, it would have been very similar. There's very few leaders who can listen to different points of view, can act on them, can make decisions based in their head on what what would work best for the general good, you might say. It, it doesn't happen too often. Ideology takes over. It's a case study also you can use in terms of a uh, popular term now, stakeholder analysis. How do you deal with all the different stakeholders? Even how he put together his cabinet, cabinet right? Team of rivals, uh, the use of innovation. You know, when do you adapt, when do you change? And Leakin supposedly was a great storyteller. He can convert people just on the power of his stories right. and all that. Thanks for so, bringing that up, Ed. I should have said that. You're absolutely right. He loved telling tall tales. I think it is interesting and very apt that we end with a hero who's a storyteller, because essentially Lincoln, that's how he won hearts and minds. Those the, the debate, the debates he had with Douglas, I mean, he really, you know, they didn't even have notes. They could talk for three hours debating. It was a skill that was so important because there was no alternatives then. Now, now you get stumble bums who can barely talk. But I mean, he, he remarkable. And, this, and the speeches he gave, I mean, I don't have to go into this, you know, the great speeches he gave at Gettysburg. And he also read and memorized, to a large extent, Shakespeare. He constantly was reading Shakespeare and memorized a lot of it. So he learned about rhetoric, learned about using language, which I think is absolutely essential. I mean, Shackleton probably didn't have those virtues, but Mandela did and Lincoln did. Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis apparently practiced the accent over and over again to speak like Lincoln. Let's say we're giving you kind of a massive projector to watch these things on with your snack, which we will find out about in a second. But you're getting a real snapshot of American history that feels real and authentic and deep. And America is such a new country. It's, it's part of its roots. So actually hearing those actors speak in early American accents was quite quite exciting and quite fun. And you picked one of the great actors of our time. I mean, that was a wonderful choice. It's hard to know who else could have done that that well. There was, there was a scene that I remember that I always, I always go back to. Uh, and in some ways, I thought it was not essential to the movie, but maybe it is on a, on a soulful level. And it's where uh, you see slaves that are walking by. I guess they're emancipated slaves. And one goes up to Lincoln to thank him. And uh, I just thought the beauty of that is that I'm a real big believer that gratitude is really important to take the time to say thank you. But also it's, it's a moment between two people from completely different backgrounds. And there's, to me, this acknowledgement of a common uh, humanity. There's a common appreciation and there's a resilience and a reliance on each other that I thought at that moment you know, when I look at movies, I start directing it in my head. And so there's a part of me that says, well, that wasn't essential, but it was because it's the one I always go back to. And I think it's that old, that we're all in it together, that we should be taking care of each other and we should be grateful for the opportunity to support and take care of each other. So I, I always go back to that, that moment. What snack would you take and what book would you take with you on this uh, journey? I was torn on the books between two books, the essays of Montaigne and the complete works of Shakespeare. Montaigne's essays are wonderful for who am I? They're wonderful books if you're going to be alone and trying to think, what do I know? How do I know it? So I would take that Shakespeare piece because it would, you'd never run out of reading it. You could read all plays and then start all over again. It's the language, the themes. Shakespeare, by the way, read Montaigne and he took quite a bit out of Montaigne. It was translated into English in 1592 or something, and he had a copy of it. I mean, Shakespeare just, it's like water in the ocean. It's just always there. I would take those two books if I could allow to take two books. What snacks would I take? Potato knishes. I would take a big batch of potato knishes. They, they fill you up. They make you feel good. They remind me of home. They remind me of family. They taste good. There's nothing, nothing wrong I could say about them. I would try to get a whole bunch of them and roast them over a fire, keep them warm. 
in my weird mind, I've started thinking about Brooklyn movies since you planted that. But do you remember the one with, I think it was Cary Grant, the arsenic and old Blake? Uh, oh, yes, that's right. That does take place in Brooklyn. Yeah, and it looks kind of like Brooklyn. You guys really know your movies, man. I'm really impressed. But the two others that I would throw in there that are Brooklyn, Goodfellas. We knew guys like that. You're right. Apt. I should have thought of that. You're absolutely right. People who spoke that way. And, and the Spike Lee movie, Do the Right Thing. Yeah. Do the right thing. And he, yeah, I think he also wrote made a movie called Crooklyn. Yes. Which is a fairly good title for a movie. And very true, because it shows you there is a tension. There's a line that you would walk in growing up in Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, one of the things I learned is you have to treat people well, because there's always someone who, if you don't treat them right, yeah, it'll, uh, Goodfellas type situations. What do you think you're laughing at? Who are you looking at? <laughs> right, exactly. Larry, we're just so grateful and thankful that you're able to join us. Ed and I are so happy to have you. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. I enjoyed this very much. It was the best hour I spent. Go for launch. T minus 30 seconds. Roger, go. Good luck with the mission, guys. T minus 15 seconds. Thanks. Thanks for sending me to the moon. I feel the ignition. We're starting to shake a little bit. And when you eat your knish, you can say it's a small bite for man and a large bite for mankind. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Oh, we're moving. We're going places. <laughs> Power and telemetry nominal. Bye, Larry. Bon voyage. See you on the moon. Vehicle supersonic. Bring the knishes. Save some food for us. Oh, yeah. You're not kidding. <laughs> Fourth Wall was presented by Jessica Fox and Ed Hoffman and they were joined by special guest Larry Prusak. It was produced, edited, and sound designed by me, Ben Please, for Expo North Digital.